how far would you go for a million dollars, Ursulan? Would you wear a dress to school? <laughs> I probably would for a million dollars. <laughs> would you shave your head and wear makeup for a week for a million dollars? <laughs> I probably would. I probably would. Well, here's a tougher question. Would you deprive a dying child of medicine for a million dollars? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's precisely what the medicinal and pharmaceutical industries of today are doing, depriving the poor of medicine for a profit. Now, the progression of medicine has, without a doubt, brought many improvements to our quality of life. Imagine, just imagine having four children and seeing only one of them become adults because of polio. Imagine being the only child in your family to live because of the flu. Well, thanks to medicine, that's no longer an issue. Medicine has increased life expectancies from 45 to well over 60. And infant mortality rates have dropped to fewer than 2% per year in most countries. Now, even though these advancements have undoubtedly improved our lives, the medicinal industry has been all that it's cracked up to be. For example, I was taken back when I found out our family's medical insurance cost $25,000. $25,000. That's more than half the average American income, and the only way we're able to afford this is through my father's company benefits. We are truly blessed to have such access to healthcare because, frankly, most people don't. They say wherever the art of medicine is loved, there's also a love for humanity. Now that takes us to our topic of discussion. The pharmaceutical and medicinal industries have without a doubt served mankind well, but they have the capacity for so much more because most people today still don't have the kind of access to healthcare that you and I do. Now, we, the people of the 21st century, and the people of the first world are obligated to not only innovate our medicines and technology, but to also innovate their accessibility so that not only the rich, but also the poor benefit from our advancements. Now, I remember just last year, Arsalan and I, we were working on a biology project and it was on medicine and vaccines, etc. And of course, we stumbled across many of the major breakthroughs in the past hundred years. There was only one, just one, that struck us as very relevant and made our hearts feel heavy. And that was a polio vaccination developed by Jonas Salk. Now, I'm sure many of you are asking yourselves, who is Jonas Salk? Why was he any different from any other researcher, scientist, or doctor? And I'll tell you why. At the time of the vaccine's introduction, polio was plaguing much of the world, especially the United States, in which there were over 50,000 cases in 1957 alone. Even President Roosevelt, just 10 years earlier, succumbed to the disease. Now, the day in which the vaccine was introduced was hailed as a national holiday because of the huge threat polio posed to the general public. Now, during a televised interview that day, Jonas Salk was asked by an interviewer who owned the patent to the vaccine. Now, I remember watching the video. Jonas Salk, he just stared right into the interviewer's eyes and he said, the people own the patent. There is no patent. Could you patent the sun? <laughs> Could you patent the sun? By not patenting his polio vaccine, Jonas Salk missed out on not millions, but billions of dollars of profit. His actions totally eradicated polio all around the United States, and it helped save millions of lives across the world. Can you just imagine a world in which medicine wasn't patented? <sighs> now, here's the thing. It seems to Ahmed and I as if the medicinal industry has become more of a business opportunity. To put it into perspective, the average profit margin of the automobile industry is around 5% whereas the average profit margin of the pharmaceutical industry is around 30%. 30%. That basically eliminates any chance of a poor person having the financial capabilities of affording the medicine he or she may need. And now, there's another reason why Ursuline and I find medicine has become more of a business opportunity. And that's because when doctors take the Hippocratic Oath, also known as a physician's oath, they pledge to place utmost importance on the lives of their patients. Now, Arsenal and I, after extensive research, have found that the Hippocratic Oath has become more of the hypocrite's oath. And why is that? That's because doctors now act upon the notion that they will be paid regardless of whether or not their patients survive, completely contradicting the oath. Moreover, social standing has become a deciding factor as to the quality of treatment that patients receive, if any at all. And that completely contradicts the physician's oath. That's why we as a society must do away with our selfish desires when it comes to make medicine. It makes sense for one to want to be rewarded for their blood, sweat, and tears, but when lives are on the line, laws should be passed to make exceptions for medicine, as the goal of medicine is to help people. Now, there are many ways to balance compassion and profit that just haven't been pushed for in the medicinal industry. For example, there's an initiative by a very famous footwear company I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Some of you may even be wearing their shoes right now. 
Now, essentially, customers of this company, they buy two pairs of shoes, one that they get to take home and wear, and one that goes to someone in need. Now, today, this company is a multi-million dollar corporation, really showing the success such a policy can yield for any such company. Now, if this policy was extended to the pharmaceutical and the medical industry, then those companies would not only yield significant revenue, but would also help provide for the poor. Another policy that could be adopted by the pharmaceutical industries is pricing medical products differently. In this policy, the same medical products will be sold at different prices to different buyers in the aim of improving affordability. Now, some in the audience might claim that they've heard of this policy before, and that's because it is already being used, but it's used at such a low extent in which it has made no significant difference. If pharmaceutical companies were to follow the ideal that Ahmed and I have in place, they would sell the drugs, they, they would sell the drugs to third world countries at a lower rate than they would to first world countries, thus providing for the poor and making a profit simultaneously. Now these are just two economic methods that could be applied to help alleviate the world of its medicinal related issues. However, even if such policies were implemented on the global scale, most people would still not have the sort of access to medical and health care that we do. And that's why the inaccessibility of medicine is such a huge issue. Let's give the example of Magic Johnson, one of the greatest NBA players of all time and my personal favorite. Magic Johnson has been able to live with HIV for 20 plus years because he has the ability to afford the drugs he needs. Now, Magic Johnson was a special case and he received special care. And the fact of the matter is, is that most people aren't special cases who receive special care in specialized facilities with specialized drugs. A very personal experience I had with this was of my mother's late Uncle Omar, who died just months ago and succumbed to Alzheimer's. Now, Uncle Omar, he succumbed to Alzheimer's just weeks after diagnosis. Now, most Alzheimer's patients, they die months, maybe perhaps even years after diagnosis. Why did he die so early? Well, I'll tell you why. Now, Uncle Omar, he lived in Jordan. And in Jordan, there are very few specialized facilities for Alzheimer's patients and very few drugs available. And only the richest can go abroad to receive treatment for their ailment. Now, I wholeheartedly believe that if Uncle Omar had the access to medicine, had the access to facilities, had the access to the drugs that we do, and that Irvin Magic Johnson did, he could have survived just a bit longer. If only technology was advanced enough to improve medical di distribution, countless of lives could have been saved, just like Uncle Omar's. Biotech advancements based on the technology we already have today can make this possible. Let me explain. Nowadays, scientists can splice DNA, which is they can add or remove pieces of DNA to make an organism more useful. For example, goats can spin silk, tomatoes can ripen quicker, and some papayas are virtually impervious to all viruses. So, how does this relate to medicine? Let me give you the example of golden rice. Golden rice is genetically modified rice with significant vitamin A proportions. It was created to tackle the issue of vitamin A deficiency, which kills over 670,000 people annually under the age of five. Golden rice was effective in areas such as Philippines, where it reduced the death rate and, and created miracles in terms of improvements. Now, the innovation of this food opens countless doors towards the improvement of both medicine and food. If the production of beneficial compounds can be spliced into the DNA of the plants, fruits, and vegetables that we eat, then why can't immunity? Essentially, immunity is when B cells, which are a kind of white blood cell, produce antibodies with specific antigens for every virus and microbe that invades your body. And these antigens can be produced by plants if they're genetically modified to do so, allowing for acquired immunity in their consumers. Now, although what Ahmed just said might not seem very, re very realistic, if we look at what the advancements already made in this field, we can see that this is entirely possible. If we look at what leading companies such as Graminor have done, we can see that we are only years away from this innovation. A leading scientist at Graminor, Mr. Moat Sheikh, told us that progress is already being made in vaccines, antibodies, and hormones being placated into plants. However, he also asserted that such bioengineering is not already taking full force as due to government regulations. Now, another genetic modification that can be used to help alleviate the world of its medicinal issues is having plants become toxic towards certain disease-carrying insects, such as mosquitoes. Now, I'm sure many of you are aware of what an insecticide is. It's a chemical that kills insects. Maybe you guys use it in your gardens, and farmers use it in their farms. Now, plants can be made to produce natural insecticides, which push away insects, such as mosquitoes, from human settlements. 
Let me give you an example. The Bacillus thuringiensis strain of bacteria is a strain of bacteria researchers have found to be toxic to these moths in the Midwestern United States, in which they have been, and these moths have been plaguing these farmers for years now. And researchers have made the connection, and they spliced the production of this bacteria into their plants, making those plants toxic towards those moths. Now, this has increased agricultural yield and has pushed the moths away from human settlements. But this, uh, this advancement can be applied to not only the agricultural, but also the medicinal industry. For example, this natural insecticide can be used to tackle the issue of malaria. With over 207 million cases in 2012 alone, malaria is a disease of utmost importance. If farmers' plants were to become toxic to mosquitoes, mosquitoes would either become rendered extinct or they would move away from human settlements. Now, some may question the ecological impact of such an action. However, according to the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, this would have no significant ecological impact as other animals and insects will take the place of mosquitoes in the so-called circle of life. As you can see, Arsalan and I are trying to focus on and emphasize on preventative measures as they truly are key towards issues of medicinal rela relation. Now, if preventative measures were implemented, then the cures research facilities are trying to develop will be rendered irrelevant because there would be no need for cures. That's why Arsalan and I find it very ridiculous that research facilities are focusing on developing cures rather than preventative measures. Now, if we were to look at the nutrition of plants, then there would be no need for these cures because if the vitamins and minerals we need to stay healthy got to the plates of the poor more easily, then there would be no need for them. Essentially, audience, think of it as compressing the health benefits of five oranges into one orange so the poor person can get all the, vi all the vitamin C he or she may need. For those that don't know, Vitamin C is very essential for a strong immune system, and one that does not have it is susceptible to various diseases. And those aren't the only ways to help lessen the impact of diseases all over the world. Now, the World Food Program has been delivering food to over 90 million people in the past few years. Most of these recipients live in impoverished, disease-stricken areas with desperate need for medical attention. And the World Health Organization has been trying to tackle this issue, but to no avail, because they can't find a permanent solution. Now, if we were to genetically modify these plants to have more nutrition, and if we were to include medical rations in the care packages distributed by the World Food Program, then all those people who are recipients of WFP aid will become immune to whatever disease is epidemic in their geographic location. See, audience, our ideas don't need 24 hours in a lab to figure out. All they really need is a bit of humanity. And there wouldn't be a need to worry about the administration of dosages to individuals because you could just include the size dosages according to age in those medical rations. By having oral vaccinations in these foods, which are available for many diseases, such as polio, typhoid, and tuberculosis, would really simplify the job for the World Health Organization, World Food Program, or any other program that would take up this initiative. To conclude, the Declaration of Human Rights requires medical care and an adequate standard of health for every single person on this world. It is our duty, as those privileged to have such access to health care, to further this inalienable right for everyone. How can we restrict medicine to only those that can afford it? How can we let pharmaceutical companies continue on the path they're taking? How is any of this humane, moral, compassionate? If we are to take simple business policies and just further our advancement of biotech, we can totally eradicate this issue plaguing mankind. Because we really can't accept that a child dies every three seconds because they don't have the kind of access to medicine that we do. We can't accept that place of de birth determines one's right for life and one's right for medicine. We must persist, we must remain determined, and we must remain bold if we are ever to change the stance of medicine in our world today. So audience, would you hold out on medicine for a dying child for a million dollars? That's the question we leave you with. Thank you. Thank you.